Along with Roger, we have some of his colleagues. We have Patrick Lance here somewhere. Say hi, Patrick. And we have we have Corey Zellner here, and we have um, Bronwyn. Trace. You got it. Bronwyn. And so we have the team that's building what used to be the Green Line, but now we've it's been renamed almost close to official as the um, airport extension. So we're going to learn all sorts of new things about what's happening with the airport tonight. But as we always do with Transit Coalition meetings, what we'd like to do is a real short introduction and perhaps say what the, the world of the airport. And the last time I looked, we've been involved in the airport for a real long time. And we've gone there and for years we've been stonewalled by world airports. They aren't interested in serving the airport. It's not like the rest of the airports in the world. It's, it's, it's a strange place. We've been involved in the flyway buses and it even gets stranger. But now I understand that there's been some, the focus is finally, the West South Bay team is finally focusing on what to do the, with the airport, what to do with funding that isn't there, how to work on those solutions. So I'm going to learn. And there's Roger. Okay. Welcome. All right, thanks for having me here. And I, I guess I can't necessarily guarantee that I have as much influence as Art or Frank Alejandro uh, in order to kind of move quick solutions forward. But at least with this project, uh, we're laying the foundation. And um, it'll be a large regional conversation as to what the airport project should be. Now, I'm going to go over the presentation that most of you would have received two two presentations. One is this one, which is the later version, which is the one I'm going over. And then the other one has a kind of a nifty kind of graphic on the cover. That is the presentation before we had recommendations. Um, and that's what was in the alternatives analysis phase. But what I'm going to go over today is mostly that um, plain covered presentation. It's, it's a little bit shorter. Um, and provides a little bit better context. Now, <coughs> forget all the conspiracy theories that you've ever heard about why there isn't an airport connection to the terminals. Um, it just, you know, we haven't gotten around to it. I guess different fits and starts. The region hasn't really been behind it yet. Uh, you know, El Segundo was ready when this, the green line came down. The taxi lobby really hasn't really said anything about this either in the previous versions or this version. Um, what, it, what we do know now, though, is that there's significant energy and interest in making this happen. And we're, we're working with the airport to see how our plans can align with their plans and make this move forward. Um, <coughs> one first thing to kind of just go over before I forget is that we are proposing to change the name of this project for the met from the Metro Green Line to LAX to the Airport Metro Connector. And the reasons for that you know, will be apparent as I go along. But we'll, let's revisit that idea as we go along. Um, the main idea from why we, where we start is that um, okay, the green line is down here. And the Crenshaw line is being built along Aviation Boulevard, along the harbor subdivision. Now with the Crenshaw line, Crenshaw trains will now go south join the Green Line and go through El Segundo to Redondo Beach. <coughs> Norwalk trains from, let's say, Norwalk, all along the 105 freeway, will now be able to come up north to this station at Aviation Century. So this station at Aviation Century will serve two lines, the Crenshaw LAX line, which serves the Crenshaw Corridor and the South Bay, and the Norwalk line to LAX. So there's going to be a major convergence of lines here. Some of you know kind of that corner as kind of this gateway into LAX. There was a uh, prominent adult business there with a three-word title. Um, and um, there's a Carl's Jr. there. So now we then begin this study with saying, OK, if we now have two major light rail lines connecting at this point, what's the best way to take all the passengers from that, those two lines and have them create a connection here into the terminal area? <coughs> now, we start with the idea that Measure R gave us $200 million to play with. 
um, as let's say an investment by Metro, uh, but that there is maybe an expectation that there would be a partnership formed with other bodies. Um, the most significant of those would be Los Angeles World Airport. Um, now, how do we think about this connection? Now, a lot of people have told us, you know, just get the connection done already. We just just build it. Stop planning. Stop talking. Right? What, what, when a lot of people say that to us, they really mean a lot of different things, and we have to sort through what they mean by that. Some people, a lot of people have meant, well, just connect the green line into the terminal. Uh, what that means is now that we have this Crenshaw line, there's going to be a connection here at Aviation Century for all the people from the Crenshaw Corridor and the South Bay. So is this what they mean? Uh, another way that people mean, so we call this Metro goes to the airport. Um, a second concept might be, what if the airport created a system that took people from the terminals out to meet Metro? So the airport goes to Metro. And that's kind of even in the airport master plan, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, with, if you have a circulator that <coughs> circulates, maybe collects people within the terminals and then comes out to meet uh, the, the, the major rail station. Um, so this might be, uh, let's say, the Seattle, Portland, Chicago model. Uh, this might be the new, newer JFK model. Um, intermediate LRT and circulator. Well, what if we do a, a little bit of both, but we force people to transfer somewhere in the middle? Um, so the airport builds a circulator, we extend a little bit, but we create another transfer for folks. So that's what we call the intermediate LRT and circulator. Let's call that the Miami model. Um, and then we have this, okay, what if we um, move the central connection point from Aviation Century and actually funnel the Green Line and the Crenshaw LAX line to go through the airport. And so let's say that's the Minneapolis-Paris <coughs> model. So we have a modified LRT trunk. So what if we move that trunk line, that main line, let's say, from Aviation Boulevard into the terminal. So we have four models of what you can do to make a connection with the airport. <coughs> now, when we think about this, we have three modes we look at, light rail, people mover. Uh, in this case, also, we look at uh, bus rapid transit and elevated busway. Um, and the airport has asked us specifically to look at both the APM and the elevated busway. Um, we also have a number of different alignments to look at, both off the airport and within the terminal area. Within the terminal area, you can go back and forth, or you can go in a loop, or you can go through. Um, so a lot of different ways to think about that. We go through a screening process <coughs> from hundreds of alternatives to 27 to down to uh, what we carry forward into our environmental process. And most people told us that when we think about alternatives, they want few transfers, they want reliability of travel time, and want a connection from both the Green Line and the Crenshaw Line, and um, they're concerned about environmental impacts and transfers. Now, this is where we switch briefly to that other presentation. If you can press Alt-Tab, wrong one. <coughs> yeah, so let's cover this um, briefly. Oh, sorry. No problem. Yeah. Now, let's compare the four major families of alternatives, and they really only vary in terms of how many transfers people have and what's the travel time. And so a major variable is the number of transfers. As, as I described them, the direct LRT branch has no transfers for folks from Norwalk but might have transfers if you come from the Crenshaw Corridor and from the South Bay. And if you're coming from the Crenshaw Corridor, that means you can, you'll also come from the Expo Corridor, so you can add a transfer model to that. If Circulator creates one central transfer, but for everybody. So it's like it's a clear spot for everybody to transfer uh, for the Circulator, uh, for both APM and BRT. Intermediate LRT and Circulator has one, adds a transfer for everybody on top of the direct LRT branch. And in the modified LRT trunk, for some people, there's no transfer at all. It's within walking distance of, let's say, terminals 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, and 8. 
but a little bit longer of a walk to Terminals 3, 4, and Bradley Terminals. So just given the configuration, uh, that's, that's, you probably have to transfer to some sort of internal circulation at the airport. So with those transfers come vertical level changes, where you have to go up and then down, elevators, escalators, stairs. Average travel time saved actually kind of varies inversely according to the number of transfers. Uh, the most travel time savings is with the direct LRT branch and also with the modified LRT truck, more so with that. And then ridership goes, follows um, the travel time savings and then the capital cost we'll get into a little bit later. So you can start to see these patterns. More transfers, less ridership, less travel time savings. Now, if I were to compare the two light rail ways of going in, um, so we have the direct LRT branch, you have less travel time on average from Norwalk X from the South Bay with the through LRT LAX alternative. Um, higher ridership that goes along with that. Um, the there is a version of the direct LRT branch that is less than this, and there are versions that are slightly more than this. So um, that's a trade-off there in terms of cost. And then the constructability issues, there is this issue of building this new connection with the Green Line on the southern end near El Segundo, which would cause, let's say, a temporary interruption in service when we did that. Now, let's say comparing travel times, this compared to this saves you three minutes if you're coming from uh, the Expo Line or the Crenshaw Corridor. It saves you six minutes if you're coming from the 105 corridor, and it saves you about 10 minutes if you're coming from the South Bay. Because if you're coming from the South Bay, you're basically going all the way around. If otherwise, you can go this way if you're kind of um, doing that with a through option. So there's a travel time savings, but for those people going straight from the Crenshaw corridor down to the South Bay, there's an increase of about two minutes for you. So um, this, along aviation, is two minutes faster than going through the terminals. And so we have to acknowledge that if we did this through LAX option, those passengers be going between the South Bay and the Crenshaw Order and let's say the Expo Line would increase a two minute increase in their travel time. Um, now, what about the different ways of going into the terminals? Um, we looked at three station, two station aerial, two station tunnel, three station aerial, and an eight station beat bus loop. Now we actually looked at more, one station, four stations, five stations, eight stations, with one station per terminal. Um, as you might imagine, the sweet spot in terms of the trade-off between travel time, time in the vehicle, and walking, and cost, was around the, these two to three station alternatives. And so an eight station alternative would cost roughly about $1.6 billion compared to these, which kind of um, are be on the ranges that we show here. Um, 600 to 700 for this two station aerial rail. That's to get all the way out to Aviation Century. And the tunnel rail and the aerial rail three stations are roughly similar and just a shade over a billion dollars, right? Um, so you can start to see how far the $200 million goes, which is not much, um, not far. Um, we need partners to make this project happen. Um, the travel times are roughly similar. Where it makes a difference is that this loop has a shorter walk time to terminals, on average about 200 feet less than the other two. Now, the BRT, if you stopped at every terminal, would cost less, have the lowest walk times, but we do know that people talk to us about reliability. And in times of very peak congestion, the BRT could take a bit longer. Uh, we estimate between five and 10 minutes, but we're gonna do more studies uh, moving forward. Now, <coughs> for those of you who um, are interested in the theme building, that spider-shaped building in this flying saucer, or whatever you want to call it, in the center. We do have to acknowledge that this aerial rail does kind of hug around the theme building. Um, uh, and so therefore we acknowledge that there's 
potential for visual impacts with them. And so that's one trade-off associated with that aerial rail. It's not maybe the cheapest, but maybe, you know, um, you may need to think of other things. Now, some people have told us, well, that enhances the Jetsons-like quality of that building. Some people have said, well, we don't really want a unit block such an icon. Um, but it's to be kind of explored in the environmental study. And then the last trade-off is, okay, um, do we still go down Century or we go down behind it? So we compare Century Boulevard and 98th Street. Um, one thing to compare, for a circulator, an APM or a bus, they're roughly equivalent, same cost, same number of level changes. Uh, if you go along Century, you have a little bit more visual impacts to the hotels, like blocking the signs and other things like that. And you're not, I mean, there's, you're on the edge. You're basically half cargo facilities, half hotels. Whereas if you're on 98th Street, you have hotels on both sides. Um, and access to some driveways, there was concern that there would be impacts. Now, if you went down Century with the LRT branch, and it's more apparent in the, the co copy of the presentation you have there, <coughs> is that you would have to actually turn... Um, for those of you who've been to BART, right? How many of you have been to BART? Okay. You know that there's transfers at 12th Street and MacArthur and Oakland, right? And so, um, the, this 98th Street alignment would allow both trains to serve the same platform, um, although it's not necessarily the same time like at BART, but it's kind of um, get off and then get on the next train. So the Crenshaw Line and the Green Line would be able to be served by the same platform if we went on the 98th North alignment, um, basically curving around. But if we turned along Century, um, we would turn right before that station, and we basically have to create another station. So if you wanted to transfer between those two lines, and especially if you wanted to transfer from the Crenshaw Line uh, and the South Bay to get to the airport, you'd have to go get off at a platform, go up a level, go across 800 to 900 feet walking, and then go down a little. So that does affect uh, your travel time and the ridership, um, and slightly less cost, but you still have these same impacts. And so we're slightly less inclined to look at the Century Boulevard alternatives. And um, if we can go to the other presentation, um, I see a question for Just me. a quick money question. Yeah. Like if you're using the modified trunk yeah. for both Green and Green and Crenshaw or going with the tunnel, yeah. Does that mean you're not going to build the trench up and down the aviation at the end of the run? Um, while it may say that that's an opportunity, right now we're not proposing that. Um, we're, we're proposing to leave it in place. At well, point. I guess if you took it out, how much money would you save? Um, well, we estimated that, that that feature cost about $200 million. Um, so, um, yeah, it's... Well, you get the FAA out there. Um, I guess, but uh, for now we are proceeding with Crenshaw as is, um, unless um, told otherwise. Okay. Um, so let's see. How do I advance this? It's not working. So let's see. Oh. So these are the alternatives that we're moving forward with. We have four. Okay, um, and I guess since some of you have seen this before, uh, but we just presented this to our planning and programming committee just this last Wednesday. So we have the direct LRT branch following this 98th north alternative, hugging the south side of our maintenance facility, and coming back down to serve a station near Lot C, and serving LAX with either two or three stations. Um, still undetermined whether we're going to do the straight in and straight out or the loop to be explored in the environmental phase. The modified LRT trunk will go like this. Um, we have to explore service patterns. So the Crenshaw South Bay line would likely do this. And then the Norwalk line would likely come up. And at least at Lot C, maybe serve as Aviation Century Station and maybe make a loop up that way. So, um, if you kept this in, you'd have some kind of 
things to play with as far as service patterns, but um, this modified does kind of make this more secondary as a piece of infrastructure than this new tunnel. We do have to explore kind of in El Segundo kind of the impacts of this connection. And there's various alignments. We probably have to work very closely with the city of El Segundo, with Boeing and North of Bremen and DirecTV and all of those players because we may need to pass through one of their parking lots or something like that just to make that happen. Okay? Um, and then we have two circulator alternatives. Um, the people mover on 98th Street from Aviation Century in alignment as with the light rail in the terminals still to be determined whether it's two or three stations. And then the airport asks us to include the BRT alternative um, to go from Aviation Century on an elevated busway to uh, Sepulveda, and then kind of the bus is doing mixed flow traffic um, within the airport. We may explore if we're so inclined um, uh, exclusive lanes within the airport, but um, that's for the airport to determine if they want to endow that alternative with that feature. Um, some features of that, these alternatives. Now, I'll say again, the low end of these alternatives is the two station aerial in and out. The high end is either the two station subway or the three station loop. Um, if you're talking more stations, it's even more than this. So the eight station loop was about $1.6 billion, and it's over this. Um, now, some of you may know that there's a planning process at the airport to update its master plan called the specific plan amendment study. Now, we're keeping track of their study. Those project managers are keeping track of our study. There are ground transportation features in their study. And um, we can either keep proceeding on parallel paths, or there's, we think there might be paths where, um, as our study progresses and their study progresses, uh, eventually the two efforts may merge. Uh, but, um, there are all sorts of opportunities, and we're coordinating at least as much as we legally can. Um, they have some constraints because they're under um, a legal settlement with various um, litigants. Now, I do want to just point out part of that legal settlement and part of the master plan. The master plan for the airport did include two ground transportation lines, um, and they called them people movers at the time, uh, but one people mover from Aviation and Imperial, the current Aviation LAX station, up across, up north, and then across 98th Street, serving at Rent Park Center, and then into the central terminal area called the CTA, and the second one was a project from what was then called Manchester Square Ground Transportation Center into the terminals along the Century Boulevard. Um, this one from the Ground Transportation Center into Century Boulevard was, um, let's say, part of the contest, again, the challenge to the Ground Transportation Center. Now, the Ground Transportation Center basically involved, well, let's prohibit all passengers from going into the terminals and have everyone check in here at Aviation Century. That's not likely anymore. We're kind of in a post-9-11 post world. Uh, this was draft, this plan was drafted like right after 9-11. And I don't know if we're in that environment now where we're saying everyone can't drive into the terminal area anymore. Um, and so this people mover from Aviation Century is what's called a yellow light project from the Ground Transportation Center, meaning it's under question and it to be explored in spas. There is, I guess, a, technically a green light project which says a people mover could be built if the airport wanted to from the green line to the terminals. Now, we happen to have kind of, I don't know, forestalled the need for this connection between Century and Imperial, um, but nonetheless, this new ground transportation connection at Aviation Century um, could be explored under this green-lighted project. And so 
there are opportunities to think about what we're thinking about and what the airport has as its master plan in similar breaths, let's say. Now, where do we go? Um, we have to continue to coordinate with LAWA on rules and responsibilities, um, and probably something that is, is, um, is maybe less than comfortable, but funding contributions. Um, how do we come together to fund whatever it is that we want to do? Uh, and we also have to talk to FTA and FAA on how we work through an environmental process that's both um, has federal actions and state actions. And so how do we do this EIS, EIR together? Um, we as Metro are pretty used to dealing with FTA. Uh, we're not so used to dealing with FAA. And likewise, they're not so used to dealing with us. So we have to kind of um, play this dance and learn how to work with each other. Now, we hope to do public scoping meetings fairly soon, and um, we're looking to do that within the next few months. And um, a lot of it will be repeated, we'll say the same things, but we're going to be talking a lot more about environmental impacts and what you guys are interested in. But of course, central to what we move forward with is a choice. A choice on how the airport connection is made. And as you can see, kind of the complexity of all of the range of solutions that we're looking at, um, the fact that it's connection to not only the Metro Green Line, but also to the Crenshaw Line, and maybe even to other lines. Um, and the fact that it's the airport and Metro working together um, caused us to uh, recommend the name change. And so the name change went through the Planning and Programming Committee. Um, it's on consent calendar for the board, but uh, we'll see if it goes through. And so that's why we propose the airport and Metro connect. So um, with that, I guess I don't know how much. Thank you much time there is for questions, but I'll be happy to take some questions and um, Corey and Ron and I'm sure we would be happy to hear them too. Yeah, Herb. Yeah, uh, so how do uh, each of these uh, alternatives help the uh, airport reach its uh, maximum annual passenger level? Well, how soon will no, how do they? How do they? Yeah, to, you know, to what extent does this offset the need for them to do roadways and other things that uh, will help them reach their 79. I know they've been trying to get the 75 to the 4 billion uh, annual passengers for a long time. So yeah. Um, how, how do these alternatives help them reach that particular uh, goal? I, I, think, um, <clears throat> well, I don't know if they have it as a goal, per se, I guess, because um, that cap it's actually capped, so I think the airport may actually be trying to not to reach those goals. At least they're, they're constrained from reaching them. So there's a there's a cap. Um, and I guess when the <coughs> cap goes, the cap is in effect until 2020, um, which is probably when any of these would come into service anyway. Now, I I can't speak to how these alternatives will play in terms of how the discussion with the communities goes on, you know, what tolerable airport traffic levels are. Um, but you might imagine the higher ridership that these alternatives allow you to get, the more diversion from traffic you might get. And so. Um, the higher ridership you get, the less traffic, and so there'll be less less impact the more riders you can attract to the transit system. I don't know if that answers your question. I have to dance around that a little bit, frankly. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Um, I'm still on your side of the table. It's you know, how do you make the deal with, with uh, LA, you know, LAX? That's yeah. part of making that deal. Well, well certainly that, that, that would be kind of maybe part of the motivation for supporting a project is to uh, uh, minimize the traffic impact that their master plan uh, elements might have. Yes? Would expand the aviation to allow the three-car train to be 
an ancillary project you might want to roll into this project? The Education LAX station? Yes. Um, it could be. Um, however, there are other stations that also need the same. Now, what we've calculated, I guess, as part of our forecasting exercise for the Crunch and LAX line, and I haven't seen, and I would doubt, though, whether they do prompt it or not, is that um, the, the combined <coughs> demand requirements on, on both the Crunch and LAX line and the Green line probably <coughs> don't really demand three-car trains up until even through 2035. So probably the, the three-car platform expansion for the aviation, Mariposa, El Segundo, and Marine stations would probably remain a separate project. I think we're um, actually tracking that. Um, and actually, Bar um, our group name actually changed from South Bay to system-wide planning. And so we're actually doing kind of system-wide planning, look at capital improvements all throughout the system. And so the platform extensions would be one of those things and kind of keep track of and see when we trigger that point. Um, but uh, when the three-car platform extension, it would probably have to be done at the same time as the other three that are also only two-car platforms. But if you, you say you might run trains from Norwalk directly to the terminal area, yeah. for that particular service, the only station would be limiting three car trains would be the aviation station. Yeah, it would be, yes. So you could do that station. I mean, I guess it could. I guess out the south in the foreseeable future it's not demanded, but we'll, ch we'll check that again in the environmental phase. And um, if, like I said, we're funding challenged, if we had money to more money to work with, certainly we would be more, more inclined to include kind of other capital improvements like that. So you are conceptually planning all new stations to be three-car yes. stations? Yeah, so all of the Crenshaw LAX line and all of the other lines that are being planned with Measure R are being planned to with three-car platforms. And even the Crenshaw LAX line, while they could have value engineered it down to two, they, they, they did not do that. So that's kind of our MO moving forward. So the existing, I want to make sure I understand this. So the existing green line, there are three car stations from Norwalk to the stop before aviation, yes. and then aviation we got those two. From Norwalk to Hawthorne and at the right. Douglas Rosecrans station, um, there are three car platforms. And the other four stations, um, Aviation, Mariposa, El Segundo, and Marine are two car platforms. So why was it done that way? Um, value engineering. They tried to save money back then. <coughs> Is the Lot C station uh, essential to every alignment? And was that stop at the bus terminal there? Um, yeah, that's I can go back. Yeah. Um, how much time does that add to the Maybe at most 30 minutes. No, 30 seconds. 30 seconds? 30 seconds. Yeah, oh, right. Sure. Now, is a lot C station essential to every alternative? Maybe, maybe not. But I, I think to a certain extent, the airport is looking at facilities in the general area. Um, now, you asked, we asked two questions within that room, so let me kind of talk. Let me talk about the bus facility first. With the LRT branch and the circulator alternatives, it's likely that we would pursue the bus facility to be as described in the Crenshaw environmental documents to be relocated to Aviation Century. We'd probably buy out the Carl's Jr. and relocate the bus facility at Aviation Century. So all of our transit, at least, would be at Aviation Century. Um, we do acknowledge, though, that, I mean, one, the hotels on this end of the slump would be interested in a second stop for them, <coughs> as well as the airport is interested in a stop to serve Lot C and whatever is located near Lot C. And they're exploring 
you know, still in play are a consolidated rental car center, whether it's over here or over there, or even some remote garages, or even some things like remote places for taxis and flyways and super shuttles and kind of shared ride vans to collect people. Um, and so there may be facilities like that that would deserve a station. Um, and so we're part of the uncertainty that will hopefully get clarified is where are the airport facilities going and they will add more ridership than what we presented here. Um, now, if this, this station has a central station in the terminals, we would likely put all the bus connections here at the Lot C station. Um, they are there now, but we would likely leave them there because um, it's probably likely that the airport would not be comfortable with all of the local buses coming into the airport, um, given the congestion concerns I'm going with. So, we, like, while you can conceptually take the green line from Norwalk and end it here, we probably need to take it at least to here, um, if not to the way down the here. We find that um, there are a lot of passengers, well, we have about four, four and a half, 4,500 to about those 6,000 of passengers just choosing to take the bus or walk or take a bike or be dropped off at a remote station and take transit in to the airport. There are probably five to 10,000 passengers who would choose to drive to the airport area <coughs> to anywhere near Aviation Center or Lot C and then take the transit into the terminals. And so there's a significant market of people we, we need to understand more about of <coughs> park and fly passengers, park and ride and fly passengers. Yeah, I think you uh, yeah, why don't you Okay. I think you started to answer the question I was gonna ask. Uh, the average travel time on either one is from basically the on the left hand side from the station at Aviation and Century into the airport, the 29 minutes. No, no, no. What does that 29 minutes the represent? 29 minutes represents the average travel time to the average LAX terminal from three points outside of the area, <laughs> which is Exposition and Crenshaw, Norwalk and the 605 freeway and Marine Avenue Station. Okay. This is driving, and right? This is taking the train. Okay. Now, if I wanted to, how, how far north can I go on that system, assuming that the Crenshaw line is basically in place? The furthest north that you can go with the Crenshaw line in place as it is now is the Expo line. And it's from there okay. that you would transfer to the Expo line to either go to Culver City and Santa Monica or downtown LA or through the regional connector to um, East Los Angeles. Well, if it doesn't continue up Crenshaw but stops or terminates at Expo, <coughs> then how would you get downtown? You would transfer there at that station, um, go upstairs and go to the eastbound platform and transfer to the Expo. To the Expo. Okay. And what do you think the average travel time from Union Station would be to the airport in that concept? In that concept, it would probably be at 45 to 50 minutes. Probably your best bet if you're going from Union Station is still to take the flyway bus. Mm -hmm. Or drive. That's not actually fast so, driving. Yeah. Sorry? From your apartment on Bunker Hill for the Union Station, 5, 10 minutes, the flyway bus is always 29 to 36 minutes to the airport. Right. And you do better than that? I mean, I know there's days. Well, get, depending on the time of day. Well, if you're on Bunker Hill, right, and if we assume the regional connector is in place, yeah. the combination of these services is more frequent than the flyaway bus, and you'd still have to get to Union Station somehow, which is backtracking right. for you. Right. Right? So you may likely, from Bunker Hill, take the combined Expo Eastside train from Bunker Hill out to Exposition Crenshaw and then transfer to the new Crenshaw South Bay movement and then depending on what we choose you would either get off at LAX or you'd transfer at Aviation Central right. to get into the next connection into LAX. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. Aside, aside from the flyaway bus, which everyone knows about, I guess, um, you know, there, I'm just wondering, there used to be a bus on Century that went right into the airport and came right back out Century. Didn't go downtown necessarily, but it hit all the other north-south streets. It was a line 100. And I'm going kind of, um, well, at least 20 years back maybe. But I don't see why they couldn't reinstitute a uh, similar uh, turnaround uh, for whatever bus line was on Century to begin with. Um. I mean, I, I, I don't know what kind of answer. That's that a form of a question in, in a sense. I think um, that's more of a question for the airport to answer than it is for us. I think it's a determination that they have made as to. They've connected all local transit to the Lot C bus transit center for the Aviation LAX transit center. Um, there will be, likely, um, in all of these alternatives, there's, uh, we, in the base, in the no build, there's, the G shuttle will likely end here in the Aviation Century. So the G shuttle that goes down the Aviation and Imperial will likely now end here as part of the no-build alternative. And then it's just a matter of do they get replaced by any of these light rail alternatives or people mover or um, this bus rapid elevated busway alternative. <coughs> so if you're going down Century, you'd at least get as far as Aviation Boulevard, which is the hotel district. Yeah. This may not be maybe too early to ask this, and maybe your info doesn't have it, but if you build the modified trunk, the subway right through the front, do you still foresee LAX building some kind of APM on top of this? Um, there are, well, we, it's um, not too early to talk about that. I think we can explore various combinations of these two things happening. Um, in the feedback that we've gotten so far, people have talked about the mix of things to make the connections to um, the western terminals. Right? So there would still need to be some sort of connection to the western terminals. And I'll repeat, where we, that station near the theme building would be within a quarter mile of a walk which is fairly reasonable, from Terminal 1, Terminal 2, Terminal 5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, it would be 0.3 miles to Terminals 3 and 4, and 0.4 miles to the Bradley Terminal. Now, people have talked to us about um, that they would be fine with moving walkways. People have talked to us about um, bus shuttle, similar to the A shuttle that goes to the Western Terminal. People mover connections that gets to the Western Terminals either in the loop or a one station shuttle, let's say, that goes to the West. Like we get off, we go up an elevator, let's say, and then we take another shuttle to one station. So we'll probably need to explore those things um, in the environmental phase. One last comment. Is that single terminal station I'm just thinking that it should be closer to Bradley. I just think of more people coming off an international flight who are used to, around the rest of the world, popping off a plane and asking where the train is, rather than serving <coughs> domestic terminals. Yeah. Where you're going to have people driving. Well, there's going to be a trade-off, right? Because um, I guess international certainty, there is, they are more used to it. Um, but sometimes <coughs> they tend to travel with more baggage. Right? And so. Oh, what's the trade-off there? The domestics, there's there's differences, right? So families on domestics would tend <coughs> not to use transit so much. Um, business people, depending on their class, you know, tend, well, there's a mix. Leisure travelers and budget travelers would use it maybe a little bit more so. So the Southwest passengers, which is on the western side of the terminals, you know, so there's a trade-off. And certainly that's a discussion that uh, we're, we're anxious to hear from the airlines on. Um, and plus employees of the airport. Yeah, and employees as well. So, but, um, yeah, so it's, it's a trade-off either way. Any other questions? Um, I, that's, I guess that's our presentation. Probably the next time you see us, you'll 
I'll, I'll, Corey will take the reins of this um, a bit more. <coughs> we'll get deeper into the environmental phase. You were doing the South Bay one in Torrance at one time, right? Well, my colleague Randy Lamb is the, the, the project manager. I never really spoke oh. at a meeting with that. Um, he, he is part of my group. And uh, I'll wrap up here. Um, well, the South Bay is still in anal its analysis phase. Um, we are still preparing a draft for review, <coughs> review by FTA. Um, it is what's called a third decade project because Measure R has it kind of out in 2033. And so there, are, I guess we are still working out how to resolve um, <coughs> what to do with third decade projects depending on the funding because um, if 3010 or America Fast Forward do, does not happen then these third decade projects um, would get implemented in the third decade. Um, if it does happen then we're right on time as far as when our studies are. So um, we're, those questions still do large as part of the South Bay Extension. <coughs> Um, so, thank you very much for your time, and um, let's see, please take a card, if you don't have one, our information is there. Um, we are going to be changing our name, but it's likely that the green line, the LAX name, will still work. Um, we are on Facebook, on Twitter, we have our web page. Um, we can, you do still have this comment sheet, but at this stage we've made the recommendations. Um, what, what's still interesting to us, though, is if you turn in the comment sheet and you have preferences, certainly indicate them. On the front, we ask you to indicate your top two choices with a, a, a number one for your first choice and a check mark for your second. In the back, we ask you to circle your top choice if it goes in and out. But what's really more interesting to us is the why. Why do you prefer the one alternative over another? Is it kind of, is it really all about the transfers? Or is it like you really want a short walk time? Or, or what is it? What's the feature of that alternative that really makes you say, yeah, I want that one? Or, I mean, is, do you really not care? And maybe, I mean, it's just like, maybe they're all the same to you. That would be interesting to us too. I think learning more about what you care about in terms of getting to your transportation system. Um, will help us both choose among alternatives, but also to design the alternatives in ways that maximize those values. So, um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Bart, for having us. Yes. And, um, um, hey, this has been a real interesting uh, meeting so far, since I've sort of been involved in so many other projects. I heard, you know, there's been a new approach to the green line. We actually spent, Ken Alpern and myself, we spent a couple years as part of a blue ribbon committee looking about what could be done with the green line. And this has really gone beyond the box and a lot of good ideas here. It's a matter of, as, as good ideas go, the ones that are more robust, maybe we can actually have a really good transit system to the airport. It's been a cost probably a billion and a half dollars or somewhere in that range, but we may actually have a chance to get it right. So it's intriguing to see how this goes. I mean, the dumb ideas are being forced upon them, like looking at bus rapid transit. I think it's a <coughs> lame idea. I've got another guy that keeps talking to me about the mythical uh, personal rapid transit, which is used as a parking lot shuttle at Heathrow Airport, and it's Spends quite a bit of time broken down from what people tell me. It carries about 600 people a day. And I explained to the guy very robustly yesterday. I said, you know, you find yourself in all construction. We have a builder, we have an owner. And in the world of personal rapid transit, the company that would represent it would be the builder. There actually isn't any companies that understand how to go out and pitch. There is opportunities in the LA market for personal rapid transit, for example, from the Red Line Station to the top of Universal City. It would be all on private property. So that means that the owner, which would be NBC Universal, would engage in a builder to create a project for them. These guys can't even do what's called an unsolicited bid. 
And this is the concern I explained to him. But a lot of times I've got folks that have done unsolicited bids to do gondola type system in Long Beach that is very similar to the gondola system in Portland. And there's also the opportunity to Westfield Shopping Center in West San Fernando Valley. And these guys can't understand that if they're going to function as the builder, they've got to make the unsolicited bid to the owners of the property. If it's all on private property, you don't have to go through the same public process. And if you could show that one of your systems works, you could theoretically launch it and would have worldwide attention since both Westfield and Universal City would tend to have worldwide attention. So, so much for that. We've been explaining that they, they now have asked that they look at the airport as a technology, but bear in mind that the capacity is so low, and from looking at some of these studies there, the numbers of thousands of people a day that would use just the segments that you've seen, um, the technology is more of a larger rail vehicle that would meet the needs. So just bear that in mind when somebody starts bringing up some of the alternative technology that actually hasn't been proven out there. So, so much for that comment. Um, as our meeting goes, tonight we have some special guests tonight, the Transportation Tiger Team. For those that don't know, last year I went out to Cal State Northridge and did a presentation on all the different transit that we're working on with the coalition. And it was urban planning majors. And this past February, I got a contact from one of the urban planning majors saying, you used to mention internships. Could we be considered? And I got a resume. And the resume was sparkling. I mean, he gave it to Arnold. Arnold would hire him right away um, just because they're really good people. Now, interesting, anybody who knows the distance between LA Mission College and the Somar Metrolink Station is two and a half miles. The distance between the Somar Metrolink Station and Balboa and Foothill Boulevard is probably about four miles. Josh did a field study. He walked. He'll tell you about it right now. So tell a little about what you guys are doing in terms of some of the other aspects, too. How's it going, everyone? Um, like Bart said, my name is Josh Schroeder. I'm with uh, Dale and uh, Larry. We're part of the Transit Coalition, the Tiger Team. Um, what we pretty much did, the project was about uh, first looking at Silmar, uh, the Silmar train station and looking at connectivity between the 230 and 236 bus lines with uh, Mission College and then a week later that branched out to look into uh, connectivity within the community um, and we have uh, like Bart's we have a team of 10, we got project managers, we got people uh, working on grants, we got uh, JS um, analysts, we have uh, people working on grants already, right? Oh, community meetings. Um, Gail and I are always at the community meetings uh, every week, uh, <coughs> letting them know the progress that we're going with the pro uh, going along with the project. Um, like Bart said, uh, over my spring break, I spent a uh, street analysis. Um, not only were we looking into the uh, the, the Silmar station and its amenities, we were also looking at the uh, the ADA regulations and um, some of the issues. I identified some of the issues with curb cuts. And uh, Silmar itself, if, if no one knew, the, the community there, it's, a, it's an equestrian community, so not all the streets are paved. Um, some streets, there's, there's no sidewalks at all, there's one sidewalk. So I did spend, uh, I, I did spend over 30 hours walking uh, from, one, from one bus stop and then walking, you know, a uh, quarter mile in each direction doing a street analysis of the streets and uh, also uh, uh, marking if there was curb cuts or no curb cuts from uh, the 230, which runs from uh, somewhere, or the Metrolink station all the way up to Mission, and then the 36, which runs uh, from the station all the way over to Foothill and uh, where, Bal where, where it meets up with Balboa. Um, and so now we're pretty much in the final phase of the project. We're quantifying all our data. Uh, we're, uh, we're still uh, working on grants to try to fund our program, um, not only for this, but just for BART. If, uh, this is like a pilot project, and CSUN is uh, Cal State University Northridge. Um, this opportunity that came to us is we want to pass it on to our fellow colleagues who, who can uh, possibly get their foot in the door with this one. Um, and so we're trying to work on grants for ourselves and help out uh, everything else. Um, but that's pretty much the majority of what we've been doing 
So it's really a good opportunity for all ten of us to be a part of the program. Uh, um, Mr. Shoemaker, you want to stand up and sure. tell a little about what your pieces are? Uh, so my name is Larry Shoemaker, uh, also an urban planning student, graduating this May. So I'm excited about that. Uh, just to go over what Josh already said, we're about nine, ten interns, and uh, we're doing a study at the Silmar Metrolink, uh, the 230 and 236 service. Uh, how and if that meets the user's needs in that community, uh, and what could be done from their point of view, we're trying to get the people who actually use the service to tell us what's going on, what you need, uh, you know, what sort of problems we have. Uh, along with that, we're uh, investigating the connectivity to the surrounding services. Uh, I think it was around 42% of the buses have a bad connection with the Metrolink station itself and the train service. Um, you know, and the connectivity with Mission College, uh, we found out that, I believe it's the weekday service, doesn't run past 6 p.m., so a lot of people nowadays take night classes, uh, you know, it's really expensive to go to school, and if you can't get there, you know, that's a problem. Um, so with that, we've taken like over 400 questionnaires of students, just regular transit users, um, we've dubbed this project the Eastern San Fernando Valley Transit Accessibility Study. It will be uh, published in July on our website at csuntigerteam.com. And uh, yeah, so we've just been doing a lot of stuff to, oh, also I forgot, we're studying, like Josh said, the, the complete streets, so, you know, we need sidewalks and we need curb cuts. You know, we need a complete street out there. So uh, with that, we're looking for support. And if anyone has any questions or is interested in learning more, you can come up to me, Gail, or Josh after the meeting, or check us out online at csuntigerteam.com. Thank you. Thank you. Gail, do you have anything to add? Yeah, one of the uh, major deficiencies in the connectivity is Mission College, which is a community college which has night classes. And so we have been working with uh, Dr. Perez, who's the president of the college, and Mr. Villanueva, who's the vice president. And they're very excited about this because the students have no way to get from the college to the bus station at night. So one of the areas of support we're working really hard at is getting the backing of the college, which we consider will have a lot of weight when we present for this bus line to continue from 10 or 11 o'clock at night so the night students can get to the train station. So this is really important. And also the Silmar uh, Neighborhood Council is, is supporting us and we're working on getting letters from them and support letters from, from them. So the community support is really, really important, but the college is also a big deal for us. Thank you. Also, yeah. the, the last thing is, the big idea of this is we're trying to, with our study, we're trying to increase the ridership by 10%. And if there's no increase, then the, the whole study, or the whole project that we're going for in the end, the final, for, for possibly a pilot project, would fail. But if, it, if we're trying to get a 10% increase with all of uh, our data that we're collecting. So the end result is that we are looking for a social change in terms of fixing the bus rail connectivity, fixing the access streets that don't have sidewalks or curb scales, looking up property records and working with city council members. And when they get through with the Transit Coalition intern Tiger Team boot camp, there's actually a lot of problem solving involved in this, a lot of creativity, and it's getting noted in the community. One of the major pieces that's coming out, even we observed things that there was a, in our corporate meeting yesterday, they observed that somebody was talking to the, quote, the security guard about crime and women, and it came that Metrolink had been losing some ridership because the security guard was absolutely ineffective in the afternoon. Some people's cars were robbed more than once with the security guard being present there for a majority. It's, pretty much from 5 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. The afternoon security guard is busy chatting and all, and 
they just happen to take some pictures of them not working. And it's like, well, one of the amenities of a successful station is you're secure in your property, you're secure and you have this right of not being violated and it's important. And you know, the students are just hitting on these different bullet points and we say, okay, that's got to go in the report because if security is an issue that may take you away from riding the train, it may not be something that I do. I just go out and anywhere, it's, the city is my entree, but there's other people where it's something different. So it's important to acknowledge that. But one of the things that one of the team members that's not here, we did this fairly exhaustive study. We based on, we went to Metrolink, we got their study of what bus and rail connectivity looks like, and we developed a series of charts, Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And I said to Jose, who was our um, GIS manager, I said, well, what about if we graphed it out and you see, if you can see here, the big color, which is sort of a peach color, that's the connections that don't work. Then the blue is connections, like if the train comes at 717, the bus uh, departs at 716. Or if the train, or the bus may, uh, the bus may arrive after the train leaves, but a majority of this is like arrivals, weekdays, it's 8% that has good connections, and departures, it's 14%. So in other words, translated, 92% of the time the buses don't work, or 86% 80, of the time the buses don't work. It got worse on the weekends. Saturday, you can see these slivers, there's nothing there. Most of the time the buses and the trains don't work and the same thing on Sunday. Now, Metro has to talk to some folks at Metro, and it's just they never really rethought really about the fact of, you know, the, the concept is buses and trains are supposed to feed each other. And the problem is that, um, all right, Herb. Um, Herb has been one of our speakers at our meeting, and one of the concepts is I've had these meetings with Arthur Leahy and with Frank Alejandro, and let's just say that they aren't overjoyed about this data and all. So there may be some changes and the big goal is, can we change Silmar with a pilot project? What would happen with Silmar if every bus that came in could actually get off to your job within five to 10 minutes after the train arrived or your bus connection would be on time and be there five to 10 minutes before the train arrived and it all worked out in a it's not a perfect world. Metro over the years has said that bus trains connection should work, but nobody ever did any methodology or surveys to check check what it is. So it doesn't move past uh, some verbiage. And so I met with John Fenton about a, a Monday ago, and I showed him the, the big charts and all, and showed how it wasn't working. And he noted that um, in their surveys, it also looked at the Ventura County line and and into Ventura County and most of the connections didn't work there either. He said that the Ventura County folks weren't willing to help at all. And I said, but you realize that number one, I've got 10 interns and I've got them motivated and they've learned how to do some of the techniques and whatever they haven't learned, they get to learn. And we'll see this through. Silmar is our beta, is our test child. This is gonna be something we figure out. And if we can make Silmar work, then you know it's going to be the future of transit in Southern California. So that's the kind of things we did. Herb? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Don Sepulveda and I spoke about this very subject um, probably at least half a dozen times over the last six or seven months. And uh, if you uh, talk with Don about this, I know that that will get his attention. Uh, in fact, that was one of the things uh, we were talking about doing as a study to look at the whether or not the schedules line up or don't line up, and as you're pointing out, they don't really line up, and obviously that's a disservice to the uh, tra public transit, traveling public in uh, Los Angeles County. Well, so um, I, I think if you talk with him about this and, and maybe introduce your team, that, that you know, we can definitely get his attention. Well, we can actually serve as a bench, get on his bench list, and uh, be consultants on that, because that is one of the things, you know, there, there is this whole area of of connections that aren't working. And it's really important that if transit works, you've got to be able to go, if you're going to Mission College, you're going to Olive Hospital, you're going to a job at uh, Advanced Bionics or uh, Minimed or, or 3M systems or 3L systems or some of the big corporations that are up there, transit should work. And if it's not working there, there should be band poles that work and all of this ought to work because 
as many times it's pointed out, LA doesn't really have a downtown, but if you can get a thousand, two thousand transit riders a day coming in and out of the Selmar station and using transit to do it and they get to their jobs and back again, all of a sudden you've created a new downtown in a, in a different kind of modality. In the future, in future classes, we're going to look at urban planning opportunities within the Selmar train station, what would happen if you built up. And every time we develop some of this, then it ends up being work to the real world because contracts get led and then the companies like Arup and all the other companies that are here get chances to bid on types of jobs. And you know, it could be something as simple as arup has got a fine sound lab. If you've got a rail line next to a building that you want to do some sound work and keep it quiet, Arup's got this incredible lab you can go to that teaches and shows how you can do redesigning to make something work so you can coincide a business next to the train stuff. So, support Jerry? Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you've uh, talked to LA uh, city councilmen, officials of LA. Have you dealt with people from the city of San Fernando? Actually, yes. Uh, last uh, Thursday, we had the, and Tony is going to give a report on this, there's been a series of meetings for the Valley um, Valley Transit Corridor Study, which used to be the Van Nuys Corridor Study, but it's been enlarged to Sepulveda. And it turned out, because we're looking at certain corners like Hubbard and Hubbard and Borden, that maybe it's in the city of LA, maybe it's in the city of San Fernando, which is why Gail's been pulling property records, so we know actually who owns it. When we talked to uh, City Councilman Alarcon, he's not too hip on doing anything. But since we do have a new technique with that office that doesn't do a good job about turning phone calls, three or four Tiger King members just go visit the office and we just get attended to because there's three or four of us. So we don't have to, you know, in any other city council district, they would actually be working with us and figuring out what needs to be done. It doesn't always work that way in the Northeast Valley, but we develop techniques along the way and we've, we've got a lot of friends because we've been working on problem solving and changing the way things work. So that's, that's been our goal. But, but yes, there's obstacles, but San Fernando isn't. We actually have former Cal State Northridge Urban Planning uh, <coughs> alumni that are in the city of San Fernando. So there's, you know, there's the integration of friendships everywhere. So at that meeting last Thursday in San Fernando, there's like five urban planning students with one going to go for his master's degree at Cal State this coming year. And so it's the small world of the urban planning uh, Oh, so it's kind of a fun thing. Yeah, half the station is actually in San Fernando. Exactly, and it's not just a straight line. Gail will tell you it's like a zigzag path, and it's really quite interesting how the property works. But that's been our beta test uh, study because we can make that work, then we'll probably get will spread. So that's a little about our Tiger team. Um,